um, I've got a Robotron down in my basement. And, and it's like, every now and then, I just have to go down and kick its butt. I mean, it's just, I've got to, you know, just kick its ass. And unfortunately, if I haven't played in a while, I'll get down there, and it'll just humiliate me. Now, every, every Robotron player that's really into it, and these days, plays it at 10. You have to play it at total maximum difficulty. Otherwise, it's, you can just play it forever, and it's not interesting. But at 10, it is a real nasty, mean game. And it takes you maybe an hour or two just to get warmed up. You know, the game will just kick your ass and humiliate you, and you'll get 80,000 or 100,000 or 150,000. And you're just, you're just crying out, and you just, you just like want to kill it. You're grabbing the game by the joysticks, and you're just shaking it and slamming it on the wall. And eventually, you get to the point. It's almost like warming up for a basketball game or something. You get to the point, you're sweaty, and you've got this kind of attitude. You cannot win unless, until you have this, this attitude, this total mindset of just total concentration and total rage. You've got to be pissed off. But when you're on, it's just such a thing of beauty. You know, we just, you, you'll, you'll get on a roll, and you'll just like be cleaning off wave after wave after wave of them. And you're just like, ah, yeah. But inevitably, you like start getting lazy, and you'll start getting too cocky. And then before you know it, you'll just like lose four or five guys in a row, and you're in some horrible situation. And the quarks are just like keep multiplying and keep putting out tanks. So the spheroids just keep putting out enforcers, and you kill out a few, and they keep putting out more. And, and, and then again, you have to buckle down and, and you know, get back to it and somehow conjure up that rage from within you, you know, to keep going. You know, and, and it's kind of the cycle of, of conquest and then of getting your butt kicked and then of, of going back and keep coming back. And, and if you can stand this for like a few hours, um, you can reach a million points. Um, and I understand now there's, that, that's kind of my personal ambition. I mean, there's players that, have, that do five or 10 million, um, unfortunately. But my personal thing is like to do a million. And I don't think I've quite achieved that even yet to this day. I've had like a 900,000, I've had several 900,000 games and somehow at 900, like 40,000, I'll just get weak in the knees and I just like, I won't have it, you know, and I just like, I'm, I'm watching helplessly, you know, I've just, you know, I, maybe I'd had a run of 100,000 points on a previous guy, but for some reason I'm just sitting here and I'm, I'm helpless and I'm crumpled, but I'm, I'm just a, I'm just like a sweaty, limp dish rag and for something I can't get over that million point barrier, but that, that's still my, my, my personal ambition. I know someday I'm going to kick that game, <laughs> you know, I'm going to kick its butt, I'm going to beat it. And, you know, until then, the basement appointments will continue. <laughs> it was like the man, I remember management came down. This was about three months before the show, before we had to finish this game. And management came down and goes, man, this game is a pile of <laughs> I mean, this game is, is so stupid. I mean, what are these people on here? I mean, where are you going? You know, it was like, you know, they were, they were saying, okay, you got to get rid of these stupid astronauts out of there, you know, and get some game going here, you know, because you are really blowing it. So it's pretty crazy because the night, this, this was insane actually. The, um, at the time we, for our development system, we used this thing called a Motorola Exerciser, which was this huge, the, probably the most bloated, overpriced computer ever created. It was a dual floppy disk system. They used eight inch floppy disks, which were like, you know, enormous, held like, you know, 10 bytes on them. And you had um, this $20,000 box that, I mean, would only work for like three or four days at a time before it fa something failed, you know, it was, it, was, it was horrendous. So it got to the point late in the project where it was taking like half an hour to just assemble the program. And so it just, it would, and, the, and, the, and the odds of actually getting an assembly that actually made it were, were so low that the last week of the, of the project, the f we just essentially just, just object code patches. We left the computer on. The program was in memory. Thank goodness it never was a power failure. And we just made patches in the code and just kind of stuffed them in there for the different bugs. Um, and then it was like 4 a.m. and it was like, okay, we've got to burn the ROMs for the show. And we like burned the, we like took all the, all, everything was stuck in this computer memory. So we had to like pull out the, the bytes essentially. And then 
burn them into EEPROMs. And we did it, and like it was at 6 a.m., plugged them in, it didn't work. And I was like, oh. You know, it was, it was like, what happened? You know, did we bend the pin? Did we, you know, of these, you know, 12 ROMs, you know, what was screwed up? And I, we burned them again or something, and they were like all blank or something. I don't know what it was. But finally, we burned them again, and we got the damn thing working. And we like took these chips to the show. The cabinets were sitting on the show floor, like awaiting this program. You know, so we got to the show at like 7 a.m. and you know plugged in the chips, and the thing came on, and it was just like we were just go, oh my god, it worked. You know, we just we were just you know couldn't believe it. It was like we were just so high from like not sleeping, and you know it was just, just this ultimate high to like just this thing actually worked. You know, um, and then then we then the the, the the show is the American, excuse me, the Amusement and Music Operators Association, the AMOA, which is the big coin-op quarter-eating game show and in, in the United States. And mostly attended by game, game room operators and arcade chain executives and, and various other industry hacks. And the thing is, that the tragic thing is no, none of these people actually play video games. You know, and and we had Defender out there. And nobody would play it. I mean, they were afraid. They were so afraid of this game that I had to like spend my time trying to lure people into our booth to like play the game. And um, they'd want to watch me play the game, or you know, sometimes we'd, we'd have a couple of kids in there playing the game. But mostly the game was empty because nobody, everybody was so afraid of the game. I guess it was all the buttons. You know, we just had so many buttons on there. Um, that you know, people just go, man, I just can't deal with this. So it was, it was kind of you know, people kind of. Um, I thought it was kind of a bomb, you know. Um, the buzz on the show was like Pac-Man and Defender were like bombs. Um, Pac-Man because it just played forever and it wasn't exciting, and Defender was like way too complicated to play. And uh, and people were thinking this game Rally X which was a little car racing game, was like the, the big game in the show. Um, so it was kind of like, well, we go, oh, okay, it's kind of cool, you know, maybe we'll sell a thousand games or something, you know, maybe some suckers will buy them. Um, but at, you know, at, at the time, it seemed like it, was a, like it was a bomb, but I don't know, we were just so high from finishing the thing that it wasn't disappointing at all. In fact, I don't know, we kind of maybe were proud that it intimidated everyone, you know, it's like, <laughs> we were kind of proud that the game like freaked people out, you know. <laughs> Um, we stuck it out in an arcade, and um, the first night, I didn't even show up. You know, I mean, you just you, you you stick this thing out. You've been working on this thing for months. You almost got fired. You know, I mean, there was a point where I cleaned out my desk. You know, in certain in like the dark days when I was working on the astronauts, I, I'd actually cleaned out my desk and had put all my stuff in boxes. I mean, I was that close to like just quitting, and. So I was, I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to find out what people really wanted. Like, so we, I didn't show up first night. And second night, I go out to the arcade, and the place was just, there was like people 10 deep watching Defender. There was people sitting on chairs and couches and like camped out around this game. And at that point, I figured, wow, this maybe this is kind of cool. I think they will soon realize that humans are nasty little things. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to blow up things. They're, they've got car bombers. They've got nuclear terrorists. You know, all these mass murderers. You know, all these nasty little habits that humans have. You know, create wars, threaten to blow up the world. You know, endangering the entire planet. I mean, it's clear that humans are psychos. And for their own protection, you know, we'll have to be confined in, in, in safe zones. What happens is the brains, their algorithm, which was supposed to be seeking out the closest human and then go and reprogram them. That was supposedly their algorithm. Something got screwed up, which actually I never really looked into it. Didn't really want to know because it was working good. But <laughs> they all turn out they seek, they initially will seek the first um, human, which in the case of the first brainwave is Mikey. There's one Mikey and there's all these other mommies. And so they're all going for Mikey. If you can keep Mikey alive, don't pick him up and don't allow the brains to kill him. If you can keep him alive, 
then the brains will continually try to seek them and they won't program any of the other mommies. And so in that, that situation, you can basically kill all the brains, but you have to leave one left so that the wave doesn't end. And this is the horrible thing is that so often you'll like kill the last one or it'll be a grunt will be left or something and then it'll run into like an electrode, you know, before you picked up this treasure trove of points, which is all your humans are just waiting out there and you, just, you, you, you wait for one turn, you want to pick them all up in one turn so you can turn them all into five thousands. But if you somehow blow it, then, um, then you get nothing. There was, a, there was a bug when we first uh, were working on the flying and the running of the, uh, of the ostrich. And um, we had neglected to consider is when the uh, ostrich lands on some of the floating cliffs of how is that handled, when does the animation uh, call the, uh, the running leg and, the, and then the non-leg flap sequence. Um, so there's a lot of situations where the ostrich is, there's the, the cliff is floating and the ostrich will be flying, but he's not high enough to, to uh, show his legs. So it'll just do a belly flop across the cliff. And on the one side of the screen, uh, we had two cliffs that were staggered. And uh, when it does a belly flop, there's a little hole of a couple of pixels and it allows the uh, the bird to to squeeze out between uh, between the uh, the two cliffs, and we're <coughs> we're racking our brains trying to fix it, but we were so embroiled in playing cutthroat where we would try to kill each other when <laughs> when when we were playing and testing the game, and it became a really fun trick to do is that someone would be hovering underneath these cliffs and then you'd deliberately do the belly flop and squirt out and kill the guy underneath and so we decided to to keep that in there and call it a feature. Joust 2 is the trivia question of all time I guess was that there actually was a sequel. Um, we we tried to resurrect Joust um, in 1985 um, didn't make many games but we this is at a time when very few um, video games were selling and there wasn't much of a video department anymore and uh, we had met with uh, you know, some of management we were trying to figure out well gee let's let's try another game and um, so we were considering resurrecting and doing a sequel of, of either Robotron or Joust and um, they decided to let's let's give Joust a crack at it. Yeah, right now the 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 video the old video games are are being gobbled up by by collectors and and in people's basements. But the um, the prices are just starting to to rise on some of them. You you can still get a lot of old games pretty cheaply. I had been looking for a uh, an original Joust cocktail table of which there are. There was, even though the Joust did really well, we only made about 500 cocktail tables, and it was it was really too bad because it was one of the originals. It uh, uh, it was the only two-player uh, simultaneous side-by-side -side cocktail game that was made, so it had a unique look because at the time most. Uh, uh, all the other cocktail tables like Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man, one person sat on one side, the other sat on the other on the other opposite, and then the screen flipped around. Well, this was this played just like the the regular Joust because you're both sitting next to each other, and this and the screen didn't flip. So um, I'd always <coughs> regretted that I didn't get one for myself. So I finally found one and and. Uh, and did some trades here and there, and I paid about five hundred dollars for it. But uh, I would say they're probably worth more than that now. Com compared to now, <laughs> we're we're working with uh, uh, bubble gum and rubber bands and <laughs> and hot glue. <laughs> Essentially, it, 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 the the memory in the game was, I believe, ninety six k, which is just nothing. <laughs> now, I mean we. <laughs> We waste that on title screens <laughs> nowadays. You know. um, so the the real challenge in designing games back then was how do you 
do something interesting with some nice animation and how do you do it in such a small package because that doesn't allow us a lot of variety say the words just the movie <laughs> and what do I say about them? Uh, I just want to hear them said. Joust the movie is uh, it's a, a little hobby I've been working on. Um, I guess the, the, the transition is I started off as a toy designer, then I became a uh, video game designer, and then I would like to become a, a movie designer. So. I had always thought that Joust would make a great movie. Um, the technology was never there for what I had in mind, but now it's more than there. One thing that was a real frustration for me was uh, I, I like to pride myself in thinking of all the little details. And when Joust originally came out, there was a nasty pterodactyl bug where a, a player could stand on the middle edge and, and just and just hold his position, and the mouth of the pterodactyl would hit right into the into the lance, and you could play the game almost infinitum. Um, I never could. I, for some, I'm just too slow, I guess. But um, a lot of really good players, when we first sent the game out uh, to manufacture, could do that, and that really that really ticked me off because. Um, I had taken every character, I had a grid paper of how big all the characters were, I mapped out what the intelligence, the, the flight patterns of all the, the birds and the pterodactyls were so that nothing like that would, would happen where there'd be a, an infinite bug like that where you could just keep playing the game forever and ever. The, the controls were totally uh, one of a kind at the time and, and they've hardly been used ever since. Uh, you know, Eugene really, uh, you know, wanted to give you that monster control and, and part of the, you know, one of the really adrenaline rushes in the game as a result of, of the amount of power you have. You've got so much power and control that, you, that the game can put you in really tough situations you can actually fight your way out of. And that's one thing that keeps people coming back to it over and over. Yes. Um, well, Eugene and I did. Uh, we, you know, we shared the load. It was uh, we had to d a lot to do in a pretty short period. Um, in the uh, in the sense of doing a sequel, um, we were in a world where the only th there were a couple of uh, sequel games at the time. They had done Asteroids Deluxe behind Asteroids, and they took everything that was fun out of the game. And they had done Deluxe Space Invaders behind Space Invaders, which was essentially the same game. And we wanted something that would give some good new appeal to the game, but that wouldn't be playable by the good players to the extent where they were playing 10, 15, 20 minutes on Defender. If they walk up to Stargate and are playing 20 minutes a game, this game's not going to have any ability to make money. So we... Um, you know, worked really hard to come up with a mechanism to make the game good for the for the better player um, without having him uh, stay there for long periods of time. And contrary to, to what a lot of people would believe, the uh, a game that you walk up to and you play 20 minutes immediately, you're not gonna you're not gonna be very interested in. You know, you, you need the new conquest. You need to to go up there and have it going. You know, you know your you know your your dog food. And, uh, and, and, and for you to want to come back and, and try and learn and, and beat it. So in Stargate, we, we put the warp feature in, which uh, was, a, it was a matter of, of rescuing and holding on to four humanoids and flying through the Stargate, which is a pretty high level accomplishment, but if you're a good defender player, it's, it's, you, know, you can do it in your sleep. And what that did was that gave you a huge bonus took you ahead uh, two or three waves in the game and, uh, and, and giving you the bonus gave you a couple extra ships. So it was a way to get the good players to jump into where the action was frenzied and make them think that they were having a one-up on the game. And uh, it worked pretty well. There were, there were some games in that period that uh, were producing either low numbers or not at all that, that most of the audience probably hasn't had a chance to see. Um, some low production games were Mystic Marathon, um, Turkey Shoot, Inferno. Um, those three were, they were tested and there were some number built of each of those models and they can be found 
in collectors' hands, but the, the quantities are limited. Then there were games like uh, play ball, speed ball. Um, there's at least one other um, that were fully developed and tested, but were never put into production, and there are no uh, games in collectors' hands. I have the only existing play ball sitting in my office. That was Vid Kids. That was um, we started in February of '81, and then Stargate was our first game. And that, w w what else did you guys do besides Stargate? We did Stargate, Robotron, and then a game called Blaster, which is uh, falls into that low production category. And uh, we also actually developed an Atari 800 version of that game, which preceded the coin op and uh, was never brought to the market. When I first got the Digital Eclipse program, I, you know, my, my mind was blown. My first encounter was actually uh, Paul DeSalt called me over to the, to the front of our building, and there's two guys there with a Macintosh, and Paul goes, I want to show you something. And, you know, he plays with his Macintosh and types something, and all of a sudden the, the carpet sweeps of the memory test, which is pretty much a signature of the old Williams games, um, is appearing on the Mac, and I'm like, oh my God, you guys wrote a simulator. If someone had told me in 1982 that in 1995 I'd be sitting on my computer playing on a machine that's simulating the program, my exact work, I, I mean, I would have thought, you know, I, I would have wondered what the guy was smoking. Um, the uh, the games themselves, when they were done, were such a struggle against what could technically be done with affordable horsepower. The, 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 the fact that this could happen is, is just, uh, you know, represents amazing growth in the, in the speed and size of these computers. The most amazing project was the Defender project because that was, we were the number two pinball company at the time and we were, we were yeah, we're going to get in the video game business, yeah, right, Williams. And we got a bunch of people, they were put in a separate facility um, over on Belden Avenue. And this group, you know, everybody had one goal and that was in a pretty short time frame to do whatever it took to make a, to make a really hot video game. And, and the, just the way things were accomplished by that group and the atmosphere among this group uh, was just amazing. I've never seen it equaled. And you know now I'm, I've got a management role and I would love to take and bottle whatever the ingredients were um, to try and create a situation like that again. And, and it was just, it's the best situation I've ever seen or been in. We also had a sequence where you can, you know, play with the controls and out comes a copyright message with Eugene's and my name on it. Um, it's in both Stargate and Robotron. The Robotron sequence I know off the top of my head, the Stargate one I have written down. It's the Robotron. The Robotron one. Okay, it, it's three, each of the sequences are three, three combinations of buttons being pressed. And you have to do combination one, and then within a quarter of a second, when you let go of combination one, you have to be on combination two within a quarter of a second. Then when you let go of combination two, you have to be on combination three within a quarter of a second, and you have to do all this without dying in gameplay. Um, it's not difficult on a Robotron. It's much harder on the Digital Eclipse version, but I have done it. Um, it doesn't matter how long you sit on each combination, but when you let go of the combination, you have a quarter of a second to be on the next one. Combination one is move right, fire up, and press the player one start button. Combination two is move up, fire down, and press the player two start button. That is the two player start. And then combination three is move down, fire up, and you hold the fire up, up, and it'll hold the message on. When you let go of the fire up, the message goes. The thing that's unfortunate about it is that uh, the, the fellow who was in charge of that decision-making process, Noah Falstein, decided he was, he was nervous that uh, we'd get in a lot of trouble, too much trouble for putting an Easter egg in. So he buried the thing so deep down that I can't even remember this complex series of things that you have to do to get it to show up. Guaranteed no one ever found it. The bug was a real cool one. Um, when you play the game, as the Sinistar kills you, and um, start, it starts to kill you, you don't die right away. You sort of like circle over the Sinistar's mouth 
and then he chomps you, and then you're destroyed. It turns out that uh, while you're in that configuration where you're um, spitting around in the mouth but not quite dead yet, uh, one of the, the warrior guys can come in and shoot you right then and kill you right then. And then the Sinistar kills you and you die twice, which it's really rare, it's extremely rare that it would happen because most of the time the warriors, I believe in fact the warriors will not kill you when the, the, the Sinistar has you in its death grip already. But if one of their previous shots is still floating around in space, as they sometimes do, one of those can kill you. I think that's the way it works. And the, the really interesting, that was a bug and that was a drag because of course every once in a while consumers would lose two lives instead of just one, which they really hated. The kids, those kids, found out that if you only had one life left and you got into that death grip where it was about to destroy you and then the warrior shot came and killed you, the warrior shot would reduce your lives to zero and then the Sinistar would kill you which would reduce your, li your number of lives left to negative one and in the computer world negative one is also a really big number and all of a sudden you'd have 255 lives left and I, Lord knows how the kids would find these things but I knew kids that could show me this in an arcade they go up and say look at this and all of a sudden they have 255 lives and man you can play for a long time on Sinistar <laughs> you've got 255 ships left boy <laughs> that quality that I saw back then it still stands out a lot of times these days with uh, a lot of the games, the newer games that we see come out in the arcades, they're interesting, but they're either, um, they're, they're beautiful games to look at, but the gameplay is real lousy. It's not an enjoyable experience. Or they've got some interesting gameplay things going there, but they, they don't pay attention to graphically what really makes a game look good and, and can help bring the player into the experience more. Uh, there's, you don't see a whole lot of attention being paid to, to, to all of the parts of a good game all at the same time uh, as, they, as they used to in, in the old days when the discipline seemed to have been different. And so it's really easy for me to believe that there's this, you know, classic bring the old stuff back again kind of sentiment out there.